and I'm a student, Microsoft student ambassador from Nigeria. This evening, we have Jim Bennett on the call. Jim Bennett is a, uh, okay, sorry, I'll start recording. Oh, okay, Destiny start recording. So Jim Bennett is a senior cloud advocate at Microsoft, and um, he focuses on IoT. Uh, for the students, um, for the education of students and all uh, educate learners, basically. So I'm going to be handing over to uh, Destiny. Destiny is going to make a formal introduction of um, Jim Bennett, and then we'll kick off from there. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Goodness, that thank you. Uh, okay, I'm Destiny. I'm also uh, a Vital Microsoft Next Student Ambassador. And uh, to this section, uh, Internet of Things IT. Uh, Jim Bennett is here to uh, teach us on some, uh, I think, some, some core technologies and how to go about it. So, uh, Jim Bennett is, is a senior cloud advocate for academics at Microsoft. So it does things with uh, the Internet of Things, that IoT and Azure at Microsoft, and it's focus on creating content for the student audience. So I'm 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 so I'm so happy for this section. Like I want to know more about this Internet of Stuff, and I appreciate uh, you, sir, Tim Bennett, for honoring our invitation and being here. So I think uh, we can start the section. Now. I'm recording it live, and from now on, it can be uploaded on our YouTube channel for those that miss the section. So, uh, so I think you can, yeah, you can start now. Awesome. Thank you very much. Destiny, thank goodness, you. thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I always enjoy giving sessions uh, for you, so really, really happy to be here. Now, let's just make sure, let's get my screen shared. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, yeah, yeah, wow, I can see your screen. Awesome, <laughs> that's, that's always the, the fun part of uh, these calls, is, is it all working? Um, okay, so welcome everybody, thank you for joining me for this session, which I call IoT for everyone, and today we're going to be looking at a whole lot of IoT technologies, um, learn a bit about what, I, what IoT, the Internet of Things, actually is, um, how you can get going with it, and kind of work through a few demos that show off some of the capabilities and some of the ideas of things you can build with IoT devices. So, there. Ah. There's a weird thing in PowerPoint wow. where it'll suddenly keep going black on me. Um, I think it's because at Microsoft we have to use the. Sorry, Destiny. Yeah, no, no. I'm sorry, I'm listening to you. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so there's a weird thing in PowerPoint where every now and again the screen will go black. Um, it's because at Microsoft we use the beta versions, um, so we kind of dog food our tools. So if you see my screen go black, it's just PowerPoint playing playing silly whatnots. Um, so apologies about that. So yeah, as good as Destiny said, I'm Jim Bennett. I'm a cloud advocate at Microsoft, and it's my job to help students like you be successful with Microsoft technologies. Uh, I'm here to provide you with the content you need, uh, whether it's through talks like this, online content, workshops, labs, helping you uh, helping fix our documentation, anything you need to be successful with Microsoft technologies. And I particularly specialize in the Internet of Things. I'm a big fan of gadgets and gizmos. Uh, I don't know if you can see from uh, my camera, I've got all manner of things behind me. Um, you know, I love playing with all, with all the toys, so I love playing with the Internet of Things. If you want to connect with me, I'm all over the Internet at Jim Bob Bennett. That's Twitter, GitHub, Instagram, LinkedIn. Feel free to connect. Uh, feel free to reach out if you've got questions. I want to see your projects. If you're building something with the Internet of Things, I want to see what you're doing. I want to see the amazing ideas that you're coming up with. So please share it with me and please reach out if there's anything I can do to help you. Now, I'm going to start with this link, aka.ms slash IoT for everyone. If you remember nothing from this entire session, remember this one link, aka.ms slash IoT for everyone. And this will take you to this page here, which has got links to kind of all the stuff I'm talking about how to connect with me, a whole lot of learning content, um, and just everything that I'll be talking about today is in this link. So it's one place to go to get all the details. So yeah, remember this link, 
and then he can just go to sleep and forget everything else. Uh, just kidding, just kidding. This should be a fun session. Now, I always like to kick off these sessions by introducing the Internet of Things and answering the question of what is the Internet of Things? Now, the Internet of Things is made up of two components, the Internet and the thing. Now, I know this probably sounds a bit a bit silly, uh, but really that's what it is. You start off with a thing, some kind of hardware device that will interact with the physical world. So this device has sensors to read physical properties of the world, whether you're reading temperature, humidity, soil moisture, noise level, machine vibration, whatever. It reads data from the real world. It's got sensors that kind of act like the senses in your body, like your, your hearing, your vision, your, your sense of touch, similar kind of thing in these devices. And these devices can also react, um, act back to the physical world. <clears throat> they have actuators that will do things, turn on switches, light lights, uh, make noise, move, things like that. So these things kind of interact with the physical world, whether it's reading in information or doing things back to the physical world. And then these are connected either to each other to form like a mesh where they talk to each other or they're connected to the Internet and then onto things like cloud services. And that's kind of where the power comes in. The thing can be fairly dumb. It can just read data and do things. And then in the cloud, you can add your power, add the capabilities to do something with what your thing is detecting. So the kind of the, the classic example is the thermostat. So in my house many years ago, I used to have a box on the wall with a little dial and I would turn the dial to say 20 degrees Celsius. And if the temperature of my house dropped below 20 degrees Celsius, my heating would come on. There'll be a thermocouple in the, the dial. And this is basically a temperature sensor. And if the temperature went below a certain level, it would send a signal to a switch on the heating to turn the heating on. And then when the temperature goes up, the, uh, it, the, therm the thermocouple picks up that it's above the temperature I want, sends a signal to the heater to switch it off. That was kind of the basic thermostat. That's not anything smart. That's just a thing. My thermostat in my house at the moment is an Internet of Things thermostat. So I have a thermostat on the wall with a nice electronic dial and um, the touch screen controls to, to configure it. I have temperature sensors around my house and these sensors will read the temperature at different parts of the house, send it via Bluetooth to my thermostat and then my thermostat then talks to a cloud service to make decisions on heating and cooling my house. Rather than just saying Jim's house is below 20 degrees, turn the heating on. It will look at things like weather data. It will look at uh, the patterns of heating and cooling in my house to try and be as energy efficient as possible whilst getting my house to be the temperature I want. And so it uses the power of the cloud to make smart decisions on how to control my heating. It's not just a simple switch anymore. It is an internet powered smart heating system. And then because of that internet connection, I can use my phone. From my phone, I can see what temperature my house is. I can configure my thermostat. I can look at the energy efficiency of, of all of, of my devices. And so I've kind of got these amazing capabilities that started off as just a, a little thermocouple and are now an internet connected device. So that's kind of the classic example. My thing reads my temperature and controls my heating system, turns it on and off, but the cloud brings the power to that to make its energy as efficient as possible and you know, keep my energy bills low, but keep, keep my house at the right temperature. So that's kind of the classic, the classic example of an Internet of Things device. So what can we do with IoT? You know, what areas can we solve with IoT? What, you know, how do we kind of group IoT projects? What kind of projects are there? And really, there's four big areas for IoT, starting small and getting big. So the first one is consumer IoT. And these are the devices you might have in your home. If you have an Alexa or a Google Home, smart speakers, uh, HomePod, something like that, that's an IoT device. Robotic vacuum cleaners, uh, internet connected ovens, my IoT he heating system, health monitors, uh, you know, I've got a rowing machine that connects to the cloud to track all my rowing activity. All these things are IoT devices that you can that you might have around your house. And what's really cool about these is they empower so many more people to achieve more in their house just by changing the way we interact with devices. Classic example is my garage. I can shut my garage door with my voice. Now, that may seem, you know, Jim's being a bit lazy, doesn't want to get his keys out and press the button. But that's actually incredibly powerful, especially for people with disabilities, whether they're permanent disabilities, temporary disabilities or situational disabilities. 
If I didn't have the motor control in my hands to press a small button on a garage door opener, I could still close my garage door with my voice. If I broke my arms in a skiing accident and I couldn't close my garage door, I couldn't press the button because my arms were in some kind of uh, cast, you know, temporary disability, I could still close my garage door with my voice. If I'm carrying a child or shopping, you know, my arms are full of shopping, I'm going to do this in one trip, I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to, my arms are full of shopping, I can control my garage door with my voice. So if I've got a permanent disability, a temporary disability, or a situational disability, I can use my voice with all these internet things, devices, to just do the things that people without those disabilities would be able to do. Voice controlled toilet cleaning, robotic vacuum cleaners on timers, all these things are fun devices that can really empower people with disabilities to just do the everyday things around their house. So as we kind of scale up, from consumer IoT, we reach kind of commercial IoT. This is IoT in the workplace. So in your office, in shops. This is where you have things like occupancy sensors, motion tracking, temperature monitoring, to make sure you're running your office in the most efficient way possible. One example would be an occupancy sensor in a meeting room. If there's no one in the meeting room, lights are off, heating's off. This could then be combined with calendar data. You know, a meeting room is too, is too cold, but the calendar shows it's not booked for the rest of the day, and so there's no need to turn the heating on. But if the meeting room's too cold and there's a meeting coming up in half an hour, you turn the heating on in that one room. So it kind of can bring smarts to your building. It can do things like safety monitoring. Are you wearing hard hats in a hard hat area? Are you wearing face masks in a mask area for COVID-19 compliance? Vehicle tracking. There's a, um, a lot of countries where they're looking at monitoring vehicle use to make sure you're adhering to various regulations. Two examples would be New Zealand, where if you have a diesel vehicle, you don't pay tax at the pump, you pay tax afterwards based on the number of miles you have driven on public roads. So if you have like a logging truck that drives 10 miles on public roads to a logging site, drives 20 miles off road on a, around the logging site and then 10 miles back on public road, They've driven 40 miles, but they only need to pay tax on 20 miles that on road. So if you can track when that vehicle leaves the road and gets back on the road, you suddenly got capabilities to, to pay your tax correctly and obviously not be over or undercharged. And in the US, with uh, the big trucks they use for deliveries, they now have this thing called the electronic logbook mandate, which requires tracking of when a driver starts and stops work based off the vehicle. So when they turn the engine on, they, they have to count and start tracking up until when they turn the engine off. And that's to make sure that you don't drive more than the safe amount of hours, unless there is a certain situation like heavy rain means there's traffic delays or things like that, where you can log that in the system and track your hours to make sure you're in compliance. So it's kind of a whole world of these Internet of Things devices, mainly focused on things like safety and efficiency in the workplace. We scale up one more time to industrial Internet of Things, and that's where you think of things like digital agriculture. In the US, for example, there are massive, massive farms, uh, yeah, and these are patrolled by automated drones with running artificial intelligence to monitor for crop growth. They have soil moisture monitoring, pollution monitoring, uh, nutrient level monitoring all across these multi uh, square kilometer farms, gathering a lot of data to be more efficient with their farming. So, increase their, their crop yields. In large factories, you probably have thousands, if not millions of sensors on all the different machines that you have, monitoring things like vibration and temperature and noise to make sure that the machine is working correctly and is safe. And that's then combined with artificial intelligence to bring things like predictive maintenance. You know, monitor vibration of a machine and based off the vibration signals, that may indicate a certain part is going to fail. And so a predictive maintenance artificial intelligence model could pick up that vibration, realize, yep, this is going to fail, and it would then they, they send an alert to a maintenance crew and they could replace the part before the machine breaks. So there's a whole lot of stuff you can do just to keep your machines running and reduce the amount of downtime in a factory. And then when we scale up one more time, we reach infrastructure IoT. And this is 
uh, smart grids on a countrywide basis or smart cities. This is where you're starting to use devices to run your city in a more effective fashion. Things like uh, transportation, parking, you know, where are vehicles going? What routes are they taking? How can they? How can we rebuild the roads to be more efficient based off the journeys that people are taking? How can we look at the amount of pollution that's being generated and bring in regulation in cities? In London, in the UK, for example, they have a, a load of zones based off the emissions of your vehicle. And if you go into the central zone in a high emission vehicle, you have to pay a lot of money. And the idea is it becomes too expensive to drive into London. So therefore you would then trade for a more efficient vehicle before you enter the city center to reduce pollution. Also look at things like temperature. Where I am in the US, we've recently had a heat dome. So over a large area of thousands of square miles, there was a big heat wave hit like 44 degrees Celsius. And they were monitoring streets to look at temperature differentials. And they saw in a street with trees, the temperature was five or six degrees lower than a street without trees. And this is the data that goes into urban planning to say, to keep heat levels down, we need more trees. And things like smart grids as well, looking at how we can be more efficient with power across a whole, a whole country, how we can manage power levels, uh, you know, where they, the, um, the big the peaks are where the demand drops off, how we can optimize energy being sent to charge things like vehicles. You know, if you look at your energy usage, if your energy usage drops for a two hour period, that's when you want to charge your electric car. Uh, and also, if you know which areas have the most draw on the grid, you know where to build the next next set of power stations. So you're closer to the energy needs. So it's, it's, this is a huge, huge field. I cannot emphasize enough just how big the Internet of Things field is and how much is growing. Yeah, this is one of the top growth areas in technology. There's so many uses of IoT devices from consumer devices to running an entire country. Um, you know, New York City, for example, has decided they want to push the Internet of Things across the entire city and they built a whole manifesto about how they're going to do it uh, and what they want to start tracking. So there's an amazing drive towards the Internet of Things. This is this is a big area. You, yeah, I, I know I'm biased because this is one of my favorite areas of technology, but this is something you really need to get on board with. It is the future. <laughs> Now, the particular area I want to talk about today is the Internet of Things in conservation. How can we use Internet of Things devices to improve our planet? Yeah, how can we do, do things like uh, increase our biodiversity? How can we protect the animals that we have all around the world, the endangered animals everywhere? How do we protect those animals? How, do, how can we protect our planet? And this is actually inspired by a project we've been running at Microsoft called Project 15, uh, which is based on the depressing statistic that we lose one elephant to human related damage from the planet every 15 minutes. Uh, this particular elephant, I took this shot of this bull elephant uh, in Sperming Island uh, Nature Reserve uh, uh, in Zimbabwe. It's on, on Lake Kariba and uh, fantastic set of elephants there. And it's just amazing how many people want to kill elephants just for ivory. So, or because the elephants are encroaching on uh, farming land uh, or just encroaching on, on, on human space. And so this is kind of a big area of how can we protect the planet? How can we protect people, you know, things other than humans? How can we look after animals? How can we look after pollution levels, carbon emissions, things like that with IoT? Um, so I thought it'd be a fun one to come up with a few demos that show how we can use this in conservation. And kind of the first step to doing this, the kind of the first thing we need to do is track movement. If there is an animal we want to monitor, if we can detect that animal, that is a good start. So one example would be polar bears. So if when it's breeding season, the female polar bears will uh, get pregnant. They will build themselves a den in the snow. They will hide in their den. They will give birth to young. And then when they're ready, they will crack open the uh, their den. It's all sealed up the snow. They'll crack open. They'll come out. And then they will go off and start hunting. And the baby polar bears will learn how to hunt. Now, you can't monitor these with, with humans. You can't put people uh, outside every single polar bear den to see when the, when the babies are coming out. But you could put devices there. You could actually stick a uh, some form of IoT device. If you know where the, 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 the mummy polar bear has built the den, you put an IoT device there that can alert you when a polar bear comes out of its den. And let's actually look at just a very simple prototype IoT device that could do that. Um, let me just zip over to my camera. And we have here, this is my polar bear detector. 
So it's a Raspberry Pi because I love Raspberry Pis and I have about a million of them. It's a great device to use. And I've got a distance sensor on the front here. There's a camera as well. We'll come to that later. But there's a distance sensor here. This is a time of flight sensor. So it sends a laser beam out and then detects the laser beam coming back. And, you know, I have a mummy polar bear here who's going to be in uh, coming out of the den. And I've got, let me just launch the code for this. And I've got an IT device that's monitoring the signal from the time of flight sensor. And so if I go back to my device, mummy polar bear comes out the den and then goes off hunting. And you will see I've got distance measurements. Animal detected a range of 0 0.193 meters. Animal no longer, no longer detected. So this is very simple. It's just a simple sensor has some, something being detected within a, di a certain distance. Yes, it has. Right, my polar bear has now got out of its den. So I could then go and, um, yeah, I can get an alert and I can then go and start monitoring this polar bear. Now this is all connected to the internet. And so I've got the data that I can do something, do something with this. And the way it's connected to the internet is through a thing called Azure IoT Hub. Now Azure IoT Hub is the, was one of the Microsoft Internet of Things services. Uh, and it's designed to basically be a big, fat pipe. So you have this big fat pipe, this IoT hub. You have as many devices as you want connected on one end, hundreds, thousands, millions of devices connected on one end, sending data to the pipe and getting data off the pipe. And then on the other end, you can put anything you like on the other end to pull out the data. IoT hub is just literally a pipe. It's I will take messages from IoT devices and if anything wants to listen to them, they can. And then if anything wants to send a message to an IoT device, they can send it to the hub. The hub sends it to the device. And the hub just acts like this big pipe in the middle. And you can have as many on each side as you like. You can have a million devices on one side and one service, or you can have 10 services on one side of reading data from one device. It doesn't matter. It's just a big pipe. If you've done any kind of message queues, event buses, it's basically like that. Um, but it's designed for Internet of Things devices. Uh, distance sensor, no, this one's not ultrasonic. Uh, this one uses a laser. Um, you do, you can get ultrasonic distance sensors, um, which use very high, high level, high pitch sound. Um, this particular one uses lasers. It's a time of flight one rather than ultrasonic distance. Yeah, great question, Samuel. Yeah, that it's this one's time of flight. So it's all done via a laser. Uh, there's different types of them. Um, the ultrasonic ones are usually, you'll see, it looks like two speakers, almost like eyes. Um, they look really cool in the front of robots, they look like eyes. Um, but no, this one, it's just a, a laser. I'll show you. Let's turn it up. You'll see it's got a little chip there, and that actually sends out the laser beam and then gets the result back. It's a little bit more accurate than the ultrasonic sensors. It's pretty cool. So IoT Hub, I'll show you my IoT Hub. Where are we? IoT Hub is very boring. It's one of those really boring services. Uh, it's fantastic, absolutely fantastic, but there's kind of nothing really to it. It's just this big pipe. So if I look at IoT Hub inside my Azure portal, I get information like, oh, look, here's the number of messages that I've used out of my daily quota. You know, here's the number of devices that are connected. It's there's nothing really here. It's just a pipe. Um, you have to build what you want on all the all the other sides of this thing. Uh, what model is the Pi? That is a Raspberry Pi 4. It's sitting in an, an Argon Pi case, which has got some cooling on it. And then the board sitting on top is a Grove um, hat. So Grove is a set of sensors made by a company called Seed Studios. Um, and they all have sort of standard connectors. So this hat sits on top of the Pi, um, and then I use these connectors to plug in a whole, they've got, they've got like 300 different types of sensors, and they all just plug into connectors on the hat. No breadboards, no resistors, no cables. Um, it's all just kind of plug and play with some great Python libraries for interacting with the sensors. Uh, it's, it's a really fantastic kit. I cannot recommend the, the Seed Grove kit enough. It's more expensive than buying the individual components, but there's, there's no thought involved. I literally plug it in and I run their library and it just works. Um, so for example, to use this particular distance sensor, uh, I import the distance sensor and then I call begin on it. I wait to get a reading and then call get distance. You know, I'm not 
working with data managing the data myself it's just use the python library um, to interact with them it's a fantastic set, set of sensors so yes yeah, so it hub not much here um it is just that pipe it's what comes it what makes it powerful is what i build around this this is very much an infrastructure type piece now here's my my it device that's connected Demo one's my IoT device. One thing I will highlight here is these keys. This is important. These keys provide security because this pipe is not just a pipe that anybody can read or write to. There is security around the pipe. Only authorized devices can connect. Now, you can set it up so a device can authenticate itself and make itself authorized using various keys, or you authorize up front. Um, and then you know you you, you put the key on on the device. So these this is a secure pipe. That's something that's very important. Is this is a secure pipe. Uh, Samuel says those are some of the problem accounts in Nigeria. Sometimes you have to wait for two months for your kit to come from China. Kits are not readily available. Yes, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I order from Seed and they ship from China. Even the US, it still takes three or four weeks sometimes for hardware to come. Um, and yeah, obviously there's a global chip, chip shortage. So getting hardware can be hard. Uh, Raspberry Pis are pretty much impossible to get hold of now. They just run out of chips for them. Um, so yeah, getting kit is, is hard um, sometimes. And certainly, yes, yeah, if you're outside the US or the UK, then it can be, can be really hard. Um, we need to find better ways. Uh, maybe that's a that, that's a uh, potential avenue of of, of jobs is actually set up a, a a manufacturing site in Nigeria to manufacture IoT devices. You know, you can manufacture them by the thousand and ship them around. Um, could be a could be a fun fun side project. Um, so yes, IoT Hub security is very very important. With IoT in general, security is very very important. We don't want things like poachers hacking our devices and pretending to be our device and sending a signal to say, yes, the polar bear is out when, it, when it's not out or hiding the signal when it, when it is out, things like that. So we need to consider uh, making sure devices are secure. And then, so if I look at my, my code here, I have this connection string that's got, it's you know, the name of my IoT hub, name of my device and my secure key. And this is in my code. Obviously there are better ways of storing this on the device, but I'd have to, past this when I create my connection to IT Hub to say I am the device. Uh, so Abu asks, are they all plug and play with just a little, little configuration? The seed growth kit is, yes, fantastic kit. Um, you just have to know what type of device it is because they've got uh, on the board, they have uh, digital ports, analog ports, I squared C ports and UART ports, but it says on their thing which one to plug it into and you literally plug it in and then there's Python libraries to connect to everything. That's all the configuration is literally the Python library with some sample code. And they have you know, all manner of different devices that just plug in. Um, I honestly cannot recommend the CD ecosystem enough. It is, it's a little bit more expensive, but it's, you don't have to think about the electrical engineering side of it. It just works. I love it. So no, I just will highlight something about security. This is one of my favorite security stories is the criminals used a thermostat and a fish tank to steal data from a casino. This is a great IoT security issue. So I don't know if you've ever set up an IoT device at home, like a consumer one that has a wireless access point. And from your phone, you connect to the wireless access point for the device. So you, you know, change your Wi-Fi to be device name 1234. And then once you connect to the wireless access point on the device, you send configuration data to connect the device to your Wi-Fi. Well, there was a thermostat and a fish tank in the casino in Atlantic City that didn't close down its Wi-Fi access point when it was connected to the Wi-Fi network for the casino. So somebody put the thermostat in the fish tank, they connected from their phone, they set up the, th the thermostat to talk to the casino Wi-Fi, the internal Wi-Fi network, but then didn't disable the Wi-Fi access point on the thermostat. And hackers were able to then connect the thermostat from their piggyback into the casino's internal network. And once they're in, they can pull the data out. So literally a thermostat in a fish tank was used to hack a casino. I love this story. It just highlights just how easy it is to miss obvious things that hackers can then use to access whatever through your IoT device. So security is so important with the Internet of Things. You need to make sure that your whatever Internet service you're using is secure. You need to make sure that no one can hold of your device keys and you kind of you manage that security constantly. Yeah, if you're just setting up like a basic MQTT broker, for example, to send data, 
make sure it's authenticated. Make sure you have that security turned on. Don't just use the defaults where it doesn't have security. Yeah, if you use tools like IoT Hub, you get security out of the box. Uh, yeah, kind of you have to use keys to connect. So, but just keep that in mind. Keep your device secure. You don't want to find that you can hack into a smart grid system or a smart city or a factory. Got to keep it secure. Now, what we're doing here really is we're gathering data. So when when, when Mummy Polar Bear pops up, we get a signal. Yeah, Polar Bear pops up, up comes a signal. We are gathering data. Uh, so just a question popped up. What would you recommend, MQTT or HTTP? Um, MQTT, much more efficient. HTTP has got a lot of polling. It has to kind of keep polling for um, whether there's a message coming back. So if you've got messages coming back to your device, HTTPS keep polling. MQTT kind of keeps the socket open, um, so it's kind of a lot more efficient. Uh, if you're using things like Azure IoT Hub, uh, in general, you don't care about that too much. A lot of it's abstracted for you by the SDKs, unless you're doing Arduino, in which case you have to explicitly choose. Um, but MQTT is usually more efficient and is the recommended one. The only reason for using HTTP is when you're in a network with a firewall uh, that limits traffic on different ports. So if your, inter if your internal network only allows HTTP calls, then you have to use HTTP. But if your firewall will allow you to make the MQTT call, then go MQTT. Cool, so IoT is all about data. So it's all about gathering data, doing something with data. And we said that IoT Hub is a pipe, data comes in, you need to think about what comes out on the other side to work with your data. So let's think about the data that we're gathering from our polar bear. So we have the polar bears running. Ooh. So they complain there. So it's running, it's doing things, you know. Polar bear pops up. We get detection. Yeah, polar bear pops up again. We get detection. This is gathering data. It's going to IT Hub. How do we get it off the other side? So what I've got running here, I've got an Azure Functions. This is serverless code. Serverless code is event-driven code. It's a block of code that you write, you send it off to the cloud, and the cloud will run your code when an event happens. And that event could be a web request, a timer, that could be a trigger on a database, or it could be an IoT event, an IoT message. And this is set up to listen for IoT messages. It's an event hub event, um, which is, the reason it's got an event hub event, not an IoT hub event, is IoT hub internally implements the Azure Event Hub, which is basically a, a message passing system. It's just IoT Hub has some specializations on top for IoT, but under the hood, it acts like an Event Hub. So you'd use the same code if you're using an Azure Event Hub as an Azure IoT Hub. So that's why it's called Event Hub. But basically, this will get fired. I send this job to the cloud. This gets fired every time an IoT event is, is sent. So every time a message comes off my device to say, Polar Bears, well, an animal's been detected, something's been detected, that will then um call this code here that runs in the cloud and this code just saves this to a database so i can have as many devices on one side sending data to my pipe and then i've got this thing listening on the on the end of the pipe to take the, all the messages off and save them to a database and i can put as much as i like on the pipe i could have 20 functions all listening on all the same messages all doing different things or i could have one function that filters the data based off certain criteria and another function fills it differently you know one function for polar bears, one for Arctic foxes, kind of whatever. So I can, um, yeah, I can use these to take the data off and do something with it. In this case, I'm just saving it to a database. And then I've got just a simple little uh, Jupyter notebook that pulls it out of the database and plots it on a chart for me. So this is the data that my IoT device is gathering. This is the real value here. Just having it detect a polar bear is one thing, but I need to know the information and be able to work with this information to have this IoT device have value. And so I can look here and based off the distance measurements, I can say that, yep, the mummy polar bear came out of her den on the 21st of September, went back in a few days later, came back out, went back in again. So a data scientist could look at this data and use this to understand polar bear activity. If you did this for thousands of sensors, you could work out a pattern of when polar bears are coming out. And year on year, are they coming out earlier because the ice is melting, or are they coming out later? Things like that. And so I've just kind of got my data here. But the problem, there's a problem with this data, is I'm tracking polar bears. But if you look at the distance measurement, if I bring my camera up, if I wave my hand here, hello, I'm not a polar bear. 
we will still get a measurement. So the distance measurement could be a polar bear, could be some snow, could be an Arctic fox, could be a caribou, could be a bird, you know, it could be anything. We're not, we don't have any smarts to our data. We've got fairly dumb data that just says, I measured something. So how can we be smarter with our data? How can we add intelligence to our data? And actually, this is where artificial intelligence and IoT really, really come together in their own. IoT is about data, as I said. IoT is about a lot of data. They reckon in the next few years, IoT devices will be gathering 80 zettabytes of data. That's 80 trillion gigabytes. Think about the entirety of human knowledge multiplied by billions and billions of times. It is a lot of data. So how do we process this data? How do we get smart with this data? We need to start thinking about what data do we actually need? What are we going to are we just capturing everything and hoping? Or are we capturing just what we need? And then when we've got that data, are we monitoring it? Are we making decisions on it? Or are we just throwing it away? Or are we just storing it in a database and paying a cloud provider millions to save data that we don't care about? And AI can really help with this because artificial intelligence is really good at dealing with large volumes of data. Much better than humans. Yeah, if you're looking at, say, well, you want to track anomalies in vibration signals from thousand sensors across a factory. A human can't look at that data, constantly monitor it and spot anomalies. Um, they would get bored for starters, but it's just too much data. An AI model could do that instantly. They could just constantly monitor the data. So this is where AI and IoT come together. You, you'll hear terms like AIoT, things like that. This is how they come together to add intelligence to understand our data. And so I'm not very good at AI. I will say this. I can't build TensorFlow models. I don't know what all the things mean and all the layers and convoluted neural networks and all that kind of stuff. I don't understand all that. But there are very smart people who do, and they build AI services that we as mere mortals who don't understand AI can then use in our code. The Microsoft probably call it cognitive services. Um, yeah, Solomon, you and me both, yeah, AI. <laughs> Um, so in Microsoft World, we call, it, we call it cognitive services, and this is pre-built AI. So this is artificial intelligence where you can say, spin me up an anomaly detector, here's my data, um, and then you run that data through the anomaly detector, and it will tell you, yep, there's an anomaly. You don't have to build it yourself, it's built for you. And they've got things like speech to text, text to speech, um, language understanding, image understanding, image services, a whole lot of stuff that's pre-built that you can use out the box. And the particular one I, I like a lot is called Custom Vision, and this is an image AI service, and it can do image classification and object detection. Image classification is um, when you, you teach it, the, you give it like 100 pictures of cats and say these are cats, and 100 pictures of dogs and say these are dogs. And you give it a new picture and it goes, that's a cat. So it can just classify an image into one or more groups based on what you train it with. Dogs, cats, hot dogs, not hot dogs, uh, Yoda, R2-D2, kind of whatever. You train it on images and it will just classify it into one or more classifications. Object detection, you teach it what an object looks like and it will find objects in the image. So you could give it a lot of pictures of cats and say, this, this, is, this bit here of the image is a cat, and this bit here of the image is a cat. And then you give it another image and it goes, cat there, cat there, cat there, cat there. And this is a great service for building image-based AI. And we can combine this with our distance sensor to understand what it is that's actually popping up out of, out of the den. Is it a polar bear or is it just a caribou walking past? So let's do a quick demo of that. So here is my custom vision service. The way you train this up is you give it a small number of images. These, these are really smart. They're, they're, AI models for image understanding usually need hundreds of thousands, millions of images. But once you've got something that's trained up to do image understanding, you can actually retrain it with a small number of images to specialize it for your use case. And so I've trained this one for polar bears and lynxes because I don't have a cuddly Arctic fox. I don't have a cuddly caribou. The nearest cuddly toy I had was a lynx. Um, so I took this picture here and I drew a box around this one to say this is a polar bear. I drew a box around this one to say this is a lynx and so on. Just gave it pictures and told it where in the picture it was. I then trained the model. It's not many pictures. I think I've got about 45 in total. 31 of them contain lynxes, 24 contain polar bears. You know, some are just one, some are both. And then what I can do, I give it, give it another image and it will tell me in this other image, 
that whether it thinks there's a polar bear in there or whether it thinks there's a lynx in there. So it, you, know, you give it a new image and actually detect what you've trained it for in new images, which is pretty cool. And this then runs in the cloud and I can then call into this, call this in the cloud and use this to understand an image of my device and then use that to make smarter decisions about my data. So if I go back to my code here, and let's actually launch the next one. So now what I do, we're going to have, yeah, mummy polar bears ready to come out the den. Hello. It's back in again. Let's try that again. There we go. So it's detected a polar bear. AI is based off probabilities. So it's not like there is a polar bear. What it does, it says there is a percent. This is the percentage chance that there is a polar bear in that image. And internally, it store it give you like an outline of where it thinks that polar bear is. And this is said there's an 83.31 percent chance that uh, in a particular area on the image it was a polar bear, and it's detected one polar bear. And if I do with my trusty links as well, I pop the links. There we go. It's detected that we have a links. So suddenly we know what it is we detected. If I do my hand, my trusty hand, pop my hand, nothing. And so I could train this just on polar bears. And if it picks up a caribou, an Arctic fox, or you know, whatever, nothing will be measured. We just measure the polar bears. So suddenly I've got smarts in my data. Yeah, I can wave my hand as much as I like. I can get distance measurements, you know, all that, and they'll all be ignored. So I'm filtering out the data I don't care about. I'm only getting the data I do care about. And that's suddenly a really important thing for, for us. I'm just getting the right data. And so if I run a different Jupyter notebook that actually looks at the data, you can now see I'm building up a pattern of when the when the polar bears are detected and when the lynx are detected. In this chart here, I've got blue dots for polar bears, orange dots for lynxes, so I can see when different animals are being detected. So I could use this to monitor you know, whatever. I could use this to see whether it's polar bears or caribous. I could set these devices up around uh, a water hole and track whether it's hippo, rhino, crocodile. I could, you know, I could put this in um, in trees and track for poachers versus rangers based off uh, the clothes rangers where we are kind of whatever. I can train this on different things and use this with my detector to filter out the data that I care about and just throw away the stuff that I don't. Reduce the amount of data that I'm using to just the data that is important. And so I've got this a, you know, a lot more power in my device. Okay. So let's think about connectivity and bandwidth here, because what I've just done is I've picked up detected uh, distance. If that distance is within a certain range, it takes a picture with a camera, sends that picture to the cloud, analytics, and sends that back. And that takes a lot of connectivity, and a lot of bandwidth. And this is something people need to consider with IoT devices, is how much bandwidth we're using, how important is connectivity, do we still work without connectivity, things like that. Now, if I'm setting up a, a device like this in the Arctic, I might not have Wi-Fi. You know, I, there's amazing how little Wi-Fi there is when you're miles away from civilization. So how do I send that data? Uh, same with if I put sets up around yeah, a water hole. Again, how do I get, uh, what connectivity is there? There might be 3G, might be 4G, might be 5G. Um, I always found it amusing. I used to work in Canary Wharf in London, a big financial district, tall skyscrapers, really, really bad 3G mobile reception. This was back when 3G was the thing. Terrible 3G mobile reception. I then was in Botswana on a boat on a river, miles away from anything, and my 3G reception was better than I was getting in the financial capital of London. I always thought that was really bizarre. Um, but things, even if you have good cellular connectivity across a wide area, that's still going to be very, very expensive. So ideally, you want to use technologies like uh, LoRa, uh, which is radio wave based technologies that can send messages you know, miles. You could, these messages can go five, 10 miles maybe over if you've got, got a clear path, but they're very, very small data packets. You could send the number of polar bears that you found over LoRa but you can't send the picture. So how can we solve that problem? How can we get around um, having to send a picture? 
So something you also have to keep in mind is what about connectivity and bandwidth? Another example of why you need to think about this is imagine you have a factory with thousands of vibration sensors. They're measuring vibrations. They're sending data to the cloud for anomaly detection. And then just as the point where a machine is starting to fail, somebody in the break room starts streaming 4K Netflix and eats all the corporate internet bandwidth. Suddenly your data is not going to the cloud and you're not picking up in time that there's a problem. Or if you've got security cameras around a factory to monitor for hard hat compliance, that's a lot of data. You don't want to be sending that to the cloud. So how can we make it better? But I will just dip in and show this little story here. This is from a Twitter handle called the Internet of sugar honey iced tea um it's well worth checking this one out if you don't mind profanity it's full of all the bad things that can happen with internet of things devices in this case it was a ferrari uh, the, the tweet reads this ferrari got bricked because someone tried to upgrade it underground where there's no cell reception drm in cars rules so this is a 150,000 us dollar ferrari in an underground parking garage the, there's some someone tried to update the software couldn't connect, couldn't update, couldn't go back to running the car. They had to get somebody from Ferrari to travel 200 of miles to come and unlock this car. So this is not ideal. This really is not a great way to do it. You need to consider connectivity. Will my Internet of Things device work if I don't have connectivity? So the way we can actually handle a lot of these connectivity issues is by taking the AI service away from the cloud and moving it closer to the IoT device. And this is where technologies like IoT Edge come in. The idea of an IoT Edge is you would train an AI model in the cloud, and then you would deploy it to a device that's close to your data. What close means is kind of up to you, but you, for example, it would typically be on your network, in the same building as your devices. All your vibration sensors would not be sending data to the cloud, they would send it to a device running on the same net network. Same with our camera. That, you know, to pick up, you know, detect our polar bears. We would have this running. You know, we want to have some kind of AI, uh, AI model running on this, on like a, wi a close range Wi-Fi network, or even maybe even running on the IoT device that we can then manage from the cloud, deploy to the device, so we don't have to send data to the cloud for AI analytics. And what's really cool with edge devices is there's a whole lot of great devices you can get that can run AI models really, really quickly, and you can run these on the edge, and they're they're designed for AI. Uh, so the two examples here. The top one is from NVIDIA, the people who make graphics cards, because doing 3D graphics, you know, the start off with games like Doom and obviously now pervades the whole of uh, gaming, those kind of 3D graphics is floating point mathematics. And AI is floating point mathematics. So you can take these accelerator boards for games and literally run AI models on them. And NVIDIA we used to be a graphics cards company, they're now an AI company using exactly the same hardware. Top device here is an NVIDIA Jetson. It's about 100 US dollars, and that can run things like live video analytics, like eight or nine frames a second, uh, you know, just on this board, on a $100 board. The one below it, that's a Coral TPU. It's a USB device, can accelerate TensorFlow models, make them run you know, five or six times quicker than you would get on just a standard IoT device. So there's a lot of these great devices that you can, uh, you can run on the edge with your AI models on them. I've actually got a Jetson Nano running in my house. I can't show it to you because the Jetson Nano doesn't have Wi-Fi built in and you can get Wi-Fi dongles, but it's very, very picky. And even the right Wi-Fi dongle still keeps dropping connectivity. Um, so I've actually got one that's plugged into my router in a different room because I haven't yet put a wired connection in my office. Um, but I've got one and it's actually running the same custom vision model that I showed you to do the polar bear detection. And the way you do that is from custom vision. Where are we? Oh, ah. So in custom vision, when you've got a trained model, you can export that model. So I can export this model to run on an iOS device, TensorFlow, and a Docker file, things like that. IoT Edge, the Microsoft one, works using Docker files. You get a Docker file, you train it up, um, you have a Docker file container model, you push that to, um, to some kind of container registry, like a GitHub repo for Docker files. And then you say in your edge deployment, deploy this one to this device, and then it will manage that for you. And then if you update the image, it'll then push a new version to your device. So I can go here and I can download my image. I then configure back in IoT Hub. I would, uh, where are we? Back in IoT Hub, I have got 
ITH devices, got my device here, and one of the modules is a detector, my object detector. So I just configure it through this, this GUI, and it will pull it out of the repository it lives in and push it down to my Jetson Nano. And then I've got a terminal here, my Jetson Nano, where, it, where I can kind of see that the logs of what it's doing. But what I'll do is I'll just launch that demo. I launch demo three. In demo three, I'm connecting to 192.168.197.19, so it's local in my network. And then if I do a polar bear, there we go, set to the polar bear. And actually in my logs here for my Jetson Nano, if I do it again, there we go. See the logs roll. So it's actually running this detection on the Jetson Nano. And so if I was setting up um, yeah, so if I want to set up this detector, I'd probably have a nice snowproof box with maybe even all this running on a Jetson Nano so that it can then use the uh, use detection, the distance measurement, pick up movement, take a photograph, run it through the IT, the um, AI model on the device, get the results, and then just send, where is it? Just send this message over something like LoRa. So it's all encased in one, one IoT device, AI running on the edge and send that to the cloud. So that's how I deal with connectivity. If I had multiple devices, I might say have a um, you know, one box that's got the AI model running on an edge device with Wi-Fi in, in this box, and then have devices all around it, the far enough distance away that the Wi-Fi can still work. And then they'd send the data to the IoT edge device, and the IoT edge device then send that over LoRa back to IoT Hub, something like that. So there's kind of ways I can model this in the most efficient way. Okay, so that's that's IT Hub. We've looked at the kind of this pipe. Devices send data in, things take data off. We can then do stuff with the data. We talked about making decisions with that data, talked about adding um, AI to help us make those decisions. Um, but it's still, you know, when I'm visualizing this data, I create a Jupyter notebook. I've kind of got to build that visualization myself. So how can we build faster? How can we get our de deployment done quicker? And this is where things like IoT Central come in, which is a software as a service platform that is designed for you to build IoT applications really quickly. And so let's just do a quick demo of uh, IoT Central. So this is IoT Central. It's you build an IoT application literally using drag and drop. So I've got a device template, and this defines the signals that my device sends. So it sends polar bear count and links count. But you know, I'll just very quickly, we'll just spin this up now, just so we get data coming in. So I've got polar bear count and links count. So this says this is the message to come from my IoT device. I can set things like cloud properties. So inside this application, it knows this device has a location. The device doesn't know, but I've just got it in the cloud. I can set up views to visualize my data. Um, I can then, once I've got this template set up, I can have a device that, or one or more devices that use this template, and I can visualize the data. I can set the location and kind of do all these things through a web application it kind of saves me building a lot of this out myself. I can build nice dashboards. So I've got a dashboard here. This is my location for there. My device. Oh. Come on, you can connect. There we go. There we go. Let's get a part of that popping up. There we go. And so, you know, once my data comes in, it immediately starts plotting, populating the graph. And over time, this will then populate with more and more data. And so I don't have to do anything. I literally just send the data in, and then this application will show it all for me. And I can put whatever charts on here I want. I can set up uh, rules. If a polar bear comes in, send an email to me to say, hey, polar bear's just popped up. Uh, or set up jobs to delete data. I can set, and I can set up data export as well to take data out of here and do what I like with it. So underneath IoT Central is IoT Hub, the big pipe. And so I can actually set up exports to listen on the pipe. I can build my application the way I want, but if I just want to plot things on a chart and just see data, IoT Central gets me going really, really quickly. Yeah, it's, I built this entire application in about 10 minutes. I mean, yes, I've done it before, but you know, it's that quick to just add this field, 
drag on this chart. You know, I want to change this chart, I want a different chart. Well, what do I want to do? I can choose a different type of chart. I can configure the chart. You know, let's go for the past uh, one month, for example. And oh, look, this is the data for the past month. You know, probably don't want that. So let's go for one week. There we go. Look, there's all my data for one week. So, you know, I can. it's that quick to get going to, to put together the tools for reporting on your data and managing your data, which is a, a really, really nice tool. Um, good fun one to play with. So how do, let's build on this even more. How can we take this idea of we want to track things, we want to detect animals, we want to report on them. How can we take it further and build something a bit more fun? Uh, so what I've, what I've done is I've built a little little fun toy. There's a company called Sunfounder, and they make very cool gadgets. And I've got one of their cars, and this is a Raspberry Pi powered car that I can then use to do all the stuff that I've done. I can kind of do this using using this Raspberry Pi powered car. I'm going to build market, almost like an autonomous vehicle for finding animals. Now, some founders do very cool kits. They're not cheap. You know, the car's 100 bucks, and you still have to add a pie to it. Um, but they have got um, fantastic ones. They've got a dancing sloth is their new one. So it's like a Raspberry Pi controlled sloth that kind of dances and you can control that uh, through your application. Absolutely fantastic um, set of devices. And I've got one of these set up, uh, which I will show you. Um, do you have a link that can work on work one through building exactly the system? Uh, no, not exactly this. Um, I have links for building. If you want to actually build IoT projects, there is something I will recommend. Um, I will come. I'll show you it now, actually, very quickly. Uh, what you want is you want this. Come on. There we go. We have this thing called IoT for beginners. So GitHub.com slash Microsoft slash IoT for, um, for beginners. This has got a whole lot of intro to IoT stuff. It's 24 lessons teaching you IoT, and it's got a lot of project-based stuff. So you do plant, um, digital agriculture, uh, do manufacturing. So you look at um, you know, running these kind of models on devices. We've got location data, a whole lot of great stuff on here. Uh, let me just drop this in the chat, actually. That's what I'll do. Uh, not this particular one. I haven't written this one up yet. I'm going to be writing this up at some point. So follow me on whatever social media and you'll see me announce this when I write up this whole this whole flow. Um, but if you want pr uh, projects from start to finish, then there's a lot of great ones there, just not this particular one. So let's look at this Sunfounder Pie car. So let's just change my camera zoom. Come on, there we go. Well, still not the best zoom, is it? Oh, well. This is my car. Here it is. It's got a Raspberry Pi hidden away in there. Uh, four wheels, camera, servos, motors. Pretty cool little gadget. Right, just set up some animals there. And let's get this launched. Now, a little cool thing I will say is I use Visual Studio Code for all my development. Um, and one thing VS Code has is remote access to uh, IoT devices. So I'm actually on my Mac, yep, Microsoft guy using a Mac, uh, and running VS Code, and this is actually connected to my Pi car. So I am remotely connected over SSH to that car and I'm running code, which is pretty cool. So, whoop. this will just start start up the car. Uh, yeah, a few TensorFlow errors. So this has got um, a TensorFlow model built in. So this TensorFlow model here, model.pb. I won't even try and open that because it'll complain. Um, this is exported from custom vision. So I exported the, the Docker file, pulled out the TensorFlow model from it, and this code here will control the car, um, and it's connected to IT Central, control the car, and it will then pull data from the camera, run it through a TensorFlow model on device, and then upload it into uh, IT Hub and into to image storage. And so if I go back to custom, go back to IT, here we go, car. So here's the car. Let's actually 
Is it working? Uh, there we go. So the, currently, this this controls here in IT Central control my car. Forward, backwards, turn the wheels, and this image is a live image from my car. So if I actually put it back here, you see based off where the car is here, there's the animals there. That's what you're seeing. So if I'm going to go closer, see it move a bit closer, image will change. A few seconds. There we go. And so I'm slowly getting closer to my animals. So yeah, I'm doing this manually. Obviously, I could write self-driving code for this if I wanted to, whatever. But now what it's done, you'll see we've got red boxes here. So it's driven up, it's captured image from the camera, it's run this image through the TensorFlow model, <clears throat> detected the polar bears, drawn boxes around them, showed it on a graph, and we've got a chart here. So now I've got this kind of lovely auto um, vehicle I can control. I could drive this around through the through the tundra, try and find polar bears, or I could make it self-driving. I could look, or, uh, make it autonomous, how it travels, and it's sending back the data. It's just like kind of just a fun demo, just the kind of things you can do when you want to take these ideas a bit further. Now let's talk about security again for the third time. Let's think about security. Uh, now I want to talk about a particular device that Germany has banned in 2017. They banned my friend Kayla. Kids toy, camera, microphone, designed to interact with a kid, easily hackable. They could, if hackers could literally access the camera um, or access the microphone and see and hear whatever Kayla does. And so, you know, this, this is built with an app that's designed to get kids to share information so Kayla can be more friendly. And this is all being hacked. It's kind of really, really worrying. Anything you do where you're capturing images, you have to consider what will I do when I get hacked? Not if, when. So you have to really, really think about what you're locking down, how you lock it down. Um, there's so many stories about devices gathering images and saving them onto public uh, databases and people just go on there and download it. Yeah, there's a there's a particularly uh, there is a famous service from another cloud provider, uh, which you always read of. There's people are not setting up correctly. Nothing to do with the cloud providers, the people who set it up and um, they don't secure their buckets and then people download this data from it. So it's really worrying. So you've got to keep this in mind. It's kids toys. It's not safe for work, adult devices. It's home security systems, kind of whatever. People may will try and access your data. So you've got to be really secure. In fact, I can get this. Let me just drop this in the chat. Um, I forgot to copy this earlier, so I'm going to have to type this one out. I think this is the right link. If you go to this link, you will actually see this image. You will see into my house because I'm saving this to blob storage in an insecure way. To make it appear on my dashboard here, it's not being secured. So if you go to that, you will see whatever's the latest thing that my car sees. I'm going to take this down after the session. Um, but yeah, this will allow you to actually see into my house. So imagine if this was not a demo where I'm allowing you to do this, but you could see into someone's house because they didn't secure the images. So that's you've got to keep this kind of level of security in mind. I cannot stress this enough. Keep it secure, keep it private. Now, next question, how much does all this cost? I've shown a lot of cool stuff. How much does all this cost? And what's really cool is from the cloud service perspective, all of this is free. Pretty much all of this is free. Uh, IoT Hub has a free tier, 8,000 messages a day. And it, when you choose the free tier, it won't let you go over 8,000. So it's not like 8,000, then we charge your credit card. You don't go over 8,000, it just blocks you. IoT Central, whatever tier you choose is free for the first two devices. So as long as you don't configure more than two devices, you can do 40,000 messages a month free, absolutely free. Uh, so just don't go more, more than two devices. Custom Vision has a free tier. All the stuff I did in that was using the free tier. All that doesn't cost anything. Uh, the Azure Functions I was using to take data off the other end. Uh, Azure Functions is free for like the first million calls. I'm not going to call it a million times a month, so that's free. You pay a, a little bit in storage to store the data, but a few cents a day. Um, the IoT Edge, that's the only one that's a little bit expensive because you need to have a container registry to store your, your container, and usually you pay for, for those if you don't want them to be public access. Um, but you could spin that up, deploy it, and then spin it back down again. So you can keep this really low cost, so all that's done for free. You've probably seen this all before anyway, aka.ms slash free student Azure. 
if you're a student, you've got an academic email address, sign up here, no credit card, $100 of credit for a year, renews every year, plus a load of free services. So you can use that, deal with this kind of stuff, and you'd barely make a dent in your $100 of free credit. Has anybody successfully seen what Jim's house looks like? Uh, no, I have um, a ring camera and I don't expose everything. Uh, oh, you mean from this particular one? This particular link. Let me just double check that's the right link. Yeah, if you click on it, so I click on that and it says join to allow downloads. And if I allow downloads, it will actually download an image. So if you just check your downloads folder, see if that's downloaded um, an image. Yeah, yeah, it works. Yeah. It works. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, I don't have things like home security cameras because I read all the horror stories. Uh, you know, I'm very limited on what devices I have. I like some devices, but I try and keep a lot of control because I'm paranoid about this stuff. OK, um, so where can you go next with everything? I've shown you some great stuff. Where can you go next? Uh, so we have at Microsoft, we have Microsoft Learn, our online free hands on self guided learning platform. AKA.ms slash learn AZIoT will take you to a whole lot of learning modules around the Microsoft IoT projects. Uh, these are run in a sandbox environment, so you don't even need an Azure account. We will literally spin you up the resources, spin you up a subscription to do everything. Won't cost you a penny to learn all this kind of stuff, which is really, really cool. Doesn't impact your $100 of student credit, nothing. We just spin it up while you need it and then spin it back down for you. It's really, really cool. Uh, now, one thing really, I do have to bang on about is certifications. Industry certifications are really improving people's employment prospects. Uh, in fact, in the US, they're even offering college credits in return for you, for industry certifications in some places, which is pretty cool. Um, but there's, yeah, it's worth getting certified if you want to get ahead of your peers when it comes to applying for a job. We have AZ220, which is our Microsoft Azure IoT developer. You work the learn modules, play with the technology for a bit, and then AZIoT cert. Go there and you can um, take an exam and get a certification for um, for IoT. And I think we do we do some pretty good student discounts. So if you're a student, you get get this pretty cheap. It's worth doing that. That puts your your CV above and beyond anyone who doesn't have an industry cert. So I highly recommend that. I'll also give a shout out to Project 15 uh, from Microsoft, aka MS slash Project 15. This is our large IoT enterprise application for conservation. So it's like a reference architecture, one click deployment for conservation to then go and build on this to build up conservation systems. Something you're interested in. Uh, this is this will show you how to build one of these um, applications and loads of great videos on there. Talk through what the project is all about um, and the different conservation organisations that are working with us to gather this data, analyse the data, and use it to preserve animals and ecosystems. It's a fantastic project, well worth checking out. You want to get involved as well? Obviously, this is, um, I probably don't need to preach the Student Ambassador Program to some of you, uh, but uh, our Student Ambassador Program is excellent. If you want to find out more about it, we have some student ambassadors in the call who can tell you how amazing it is. Uh, but this is your chance to get involved, grow your community, um, help educate your peers, network with people from Microsoft, and grow your skills. I'm going to highlight two particular gold student ambassadors, former gold student ambassadors, now employees of Microsoft, uh, Josh in Kenya and uh, Kushbu in India. Uh, so Josh actually now does pretty much what I do, uh, but he doesn't. He focuses on like a pro dev audience rather than a academic audience. And you say he literally joined a few weeks ago. Um, so yeah, this is a great way to expand your career prospects, make yourself look fantastic. Uh, can Microsoft make the IT certification path of Azure online training day that we can write the exam for free? Um, we. We sometimes have competitions where we offer free exams. Uh, these, these exams are moderated, so we actually have somebody watch you to make sure that you're not cheating. And obviously that has a certain cost associated with it. Um, you know, these aren't just kind of quizzes that you could then look up on the internet. You know, we want to make sure that you do know your stuff and you're not cheating on the exam. So these are very rigorous exams, which is why they cost money. But we, we do offer things like um, discounts. We will do uh, cloud skills challenges every now and again, where if you complete a certain amount of learn modules in 30 days, you get a free exam voucher. Um, there's loads of ways to do. If you're interested in ambassador program, you do get, if you become an ambassador, you can get some certs for free. Um, I guess uh, Destiny is probably a good one to uh, to talk to, being a, being one of our beta ambassadors uh, or goodness. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're they're the folks to talk to to really get the nitty gritty about the program. But I I, I highly recommend it. Uh, I love working with our ambassadors. 
I'd done you know, IoT for Beginners curriculum that we built and I put in the chat earlier. That was built in collaboration with a whole lot of student ambassadors who review the content, translated the content. It's a great, great program. And it's an absolute privilege on my part to better work with such inspiring students who really want to learn, grow and help their peers. Um, ASO 900 is free after two day online training. Oh, nice. Nice. I didn't I didn't know that. I know they have different prices of different certs. Um, I've not seen ASO 220 go for free anywhere, um, but if you can get it for free, then fantastic. Um, ASO 900 is our uh, entry level Azure certification. It's kind of the, the, the basic intro to Azure one. And I know we're pushing that very heavily. So um, yeah, I've not seen the two day online training with that for free. It'd be nice if we did, did it for IoT. It really would be nice. Mm. Final thing I want to give a shout out to is the Microsoft Imagine Cup. Uh, this is our 20th anniversary of Imagine Cup. The Imagine Cup is a premier student competition. We get teams of students all around the world to come together, work on their projects, and build like a working version of something that will solve global issues, even whether on a small scale or a big scale, something that empowers people to achieve more. And we offer really big prizes. Uh, I can't remember what this year's prize is, but it's usually in the yeah you know, seventy-five to one hundred thousand dollar range, um, plus lots of Azure credit. And we we, we dig out Satya Nadella, our CEO, to give you mentoring sessions as well, which is pretty cool. Um, the reason I really I really want to suggest this to you is if you're interested in IoT, this is a great competition to enter into. It gives you a chance to try out your ideas, think about the problems you, you might want to solve with IoT, and top tip. Of the 24 finalists since 2016, 10 of them have been IoT projects. And two of them have been kind of IoT adjacent, so drones or um, mixed reality trackers acting as IoT devices. So, you know, 40 to 50% of the finalists have been IoT devices. Look, the, the recent winner was a team from Kenya, which built an IoT device for monitoring babies uh, in uh, in neonatal clinics and intensive care, they've kind of put this device on to monitor baby's health to make sure that there's yeah, the slightest risk of anything happening to the baby, they get their nurses and staff can get alerted straight away. So the you know, winner, uh, Rubeba, I think it was the team's called, uh, from Kenya, IoT device. And we've had loads of IoT devices in the finals all the way through. So if you, if you love IoT, this is a really great excuse to get together with your friends, learn more, grow more. We're gonna have a whole lot of online learning for you and then you can enter competition and possibly win a big stack of cash. So with that, I'll wrap up this link, aka.com slash IoT for everyone. This has got pretty much all the stuff I talked about today. Doesn't have the actual walkthroughs of building the things I built. I haven't written those yet. Um, <coughs> I'm hopefully putting that together over the next week or so. Uh, but otherwise, all the content, all the links to all the learning platforms, IoT stuff, uh, links to our IoT for beginners, our 24 lesson IoT curriculum, it's all there. So please note down that link, head there, read up all the stuff. And then that, thank you very much. For free to reach out, I'm here to help you. All over the internet, Jim Bob Bennett. So please, please get in touch. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you for listening. And um, if we have time, I'm more than happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you. I appreciate your time for this section. So please, if you are still the coin, you can just uh, hit the applause uh, icon. Yeah, yeah. Let's appreciate Jim for this time. So thank you very much. Uh, I believe if there's any question, you can just unmute your mic and uh, okay. I think uh, Mubarak have a question, so you can unmute your mic and ask your question. Well, uh, the last thing, yes, of course, of course. All right, okay, I think. Uh, Yeah, that's the right one. Yeah, that's the right one. Yeah, right. just drop. It's in the chat there. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Mubarak, you are raising your hand. Like, you have a question? Uh, okay. Okay. Maybe. Maybe you don't have a question. So, okay. This section is being uh, recorded, and uh, at the end of this section, we'll uh, be uploading it to our YouTube channel. It will be available for everybody to. Uh, Probably go back and listen to the section again and also share it to others. And for those interested in becoming an ambassador, uh, I tell them the uh, best thing that ever happened to me in my life. So uh, you can always reach out. Can you reach out to me? Destiny Rabo, uh, in Teams here. Yeah?
or any any social platform stay the same destiny or but or you wish out to goodness and we are very happy like more than glad to put you to wish out to any ambassador from uh the country from nigeria so we always wish out to you but so thank you very much jim okay uh somewhere have a question so yep. please if you have sure. a question yeah you can ask the question You can you can unmute your mic and actually ask your question. Okay. Uh, but if you prefer typing, so you can just type. Okay. Well, while those questions have been typed in, um, everyone, if you could use the applause button and give the round of applause to Destiny and Goodness yeah, for yeah. organizing this event. Oh, thank you so thanks. much for organizing it. So everyone can give give Destiny and Goodness a round of applause. <laughs> thank you very much, Jim. Wow, it's been a long one. It's gonna be a big question. Yeah, is there a way you can run an app on a Raspberry Pi without logging into it? Um, oh, so you want actually an app to so when your Pi boots up, it just runs the app? Is that what you want rather than having to log in and manually run it? Yes, yes, you can. Um, yep, yeah, as an on star. So the Raspberry Pi has a uh, I'll see if I can find um. The, the example for you. So the Ras Raspberry Pi, it, it basically runs, runs Linux. And so it has all the features that Linux has, uh, including a thing called the cron tab. Oh, I hope I can spell my own name. So the, 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 the Raspberry Pi has a thing called, called the cron tab. And the cron tab is basically a timer service. So um, cron runs in the background. Cron short for chronological timer, it's basically a timer job. And that will then work, uh, look through a list of instructions and run things at certain times. So you can have a cron tab that says every hour do this or nine o'clock in the morning do this. And you can also do one for, um, let me actually try and find the right thing. You also set one up for reboot. Right. So you can, you can set up a cron entry for reboot. So what happens is when the device reboots, uh, it will, automatically run whatever code that you specify. So I'm just going to try and find a, uh, just trying to find an actual example to show you exactly what the code is. Um, oh, where is it? Where is it? Um, so I can find it now. Ah, oh, so much sign in. Come on. There we go. So what you would do is you can um, so the cron tab. So you have the called the cron tab. The cron tab defines the uh, all the different rules that cron runs. It's the set of instructions that it runs. And what you can do is you can add an entry to your cron tab that says after reboot do something. So what you want to do after reboot, you want to sleep probably for about thirty seconds just to make sure that the device has connected to, to the network. So you want it to connect to your Wi-Fi or whatever, how you're doing connectivity. Then after your sleep, you would CD into the directory where your code is, and then you run it through Python. So in this case, it's saying copy to my cron tab, reboot, at, your, at reboot, sleep 30 seconds, and then run this app.py from this particular folder. And that will then start your code when your device runs up. Obviously, you would then have to make sure your code is fully error tolerant um, to so that if something happens and your application crashes, it can restart. But that's that's what you want to do. So let me just get a, I will just grab the actual link to the actual part there. There you go. That's the actual link that takes you to that thing. Answered. So that will just tell you to run your code. Uh, now, obviously, depending on how your code has to run, there's two cron tabs. There's the cron tab you get as a user. So if you just run the instructions here as a user, that will run it as the user. Uh, there's also a cron tab for the sudo user. So if your hardware needs sudo, as some hardware does, um, and there are some tools that will only work when you're using, uh, when you've got running it as sudo because it needs a minister privileges for some reason, then you can do the same thing, but just put sudo in front of it and that goes in the sudo cron tab and that will run it as sudo. But there, this will allow you to do it. So I could run this on my, I would do this on my car thing to run my car code right uh, as soon as it boots up. I just don't do that because now I can take it down and you can't see into my house anymore. But yeah, that's how you do it. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, you for that. So, any other questions? 
Okay. Uh, okay, well, so, yeah, so, yeah, no question. Thank you again very much, Jim. So please, if you are if you are still online, you can just hit the upload button. Yeah, wow. Oh, it was an awesome section. I learned a lot, like a whole lot of if I IoT. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you, thank you very much. Cool. Thank you. So, so more yeah. things that you can know, feel free to reach out and hit me up with any questions you get after this. I'm more than happy to help. Yes, yes, that's true. So you can reach out to our uh, gym on any of the social media platforms on Twitter, GitHub, Instagram, or LinkedIn. So yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thanks everyone. So, <laughs> thanks, Master Yoda. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I love my Yoda. It's so cool. <laughs> Uh, thanks, thanks everyone. So thanks. Uh, I think we can end the call now. So the recording will be available on our YouTube channel to be shared to everybody across. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs> 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 <laughs>